Hi, I'm Alan Dellinger. I work for GPM Hydraulic Consulting uh, here just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And today we're going to talk about the four things you need to know to be an effective hydraulic troubleshooter and the four tools that you need to be an effective hydraulic troubleshooter. Now the thing about it is I have several tools here in front of me uh, that you can use, but there's, there's several things you need to know two other than just having a tool. Uh, for one is the component function. Um, it's very important that we know how the component functions. If we can understand, for example, how the pump works, uh, we have a better chance of troubleshooting. Uh, that, that goes with all components. It goes with relief valves, it goes with servo valves, and cylinders. Uh, the more we know, the better chance we have to troubleshoot it. Another thing is how to adjust a component. There are many components in the hydraulic system um, that we, uh, we adjust. Uh, the, the pump compensator is for one on a variable pump. Uh, relief valves are adjustable. Uh, we even have to adjust cross port reliefs at times. We even have to know the proper pre-charge for accumulators. So knowing how to adjust these components uh, is also going to help in the troubleshooting process. Now here's another thing that's very, very, very important and not enough people know how to do this and that's how to read the hydraulic schematic. So you need to learn how to read the symbol. By learning how to read the symbol, you can then learn how to read the hydraulic schematic. If you do not use a hydraulic schematic when troubleshooting, then you're troubleshooting blind. Okay? So this is one of the most important tools right here. So Learning the component function, knowing how to adjust is part of the pieces of the puzzle. Okay? Now, once we understand these three, then there's something else that we must know as well. Um, uh, the fourth thing is, what reliability checks do we make when we're troubleshooting to help us determine uh, and solve the problem as fast as we can? Now, one thing that you, you, you want to be able to do is, we preach at GPM all the time, is um, you don't want to be a parts changer. Parts changing is not troubleshooting. Um, when you troubleshoot, you learn what is causing the, the problem. When you parts change, you're not learning anything. Okay? Parts changing results in a lot of uh, uh, downtime, uh, parts cost, and not to mention the what we're paying uh, somebody hourly to solve the problem you know so troubleshooting is what we want to do okay so there are uh, several things that we can use to troubleshoot with there are many devices out there um, I don't always just rely on one tool when I'm troubleshooting uh, sometimes I rely on several techniques to determine if it is one component that's causing the problem uh, for one we have a pressure gauge here there are many ways we can use a pressure gauge to troubleshoot. We have an infrared camera. Um, infrared cameras work well. Of course, this is the new technology we're seeing out there because you can use these guys to check for heat. Um, you can also use a regular temperature gun. Um, you know, before they started making infrared temperature uh, guns like this one here, I used to use a standard temperature gun and I and I and it worked well for me I was able to troubleshoot another one is a flow meter uh, flow meters can be installed uh, to check uh, for uh, flow to see if a pumps operating properly or check for bypassing and a current meter this is another tool that you'll need to have in your toolbox to be a good troubleshooter okay so let's talk about some of these and I want to give you some examples of how to use them now as far as the pressure gauge goes, um, you can use a pressure gauge in many ways to troubleshoot a hydraulic system. Um, pressure gauges do come in handy as far as uh, setting pressures. You can't set the pressures correctly if you don't have a gauge. So that is one important thing that you can, you can do with them. Um, so let's, uh, for example, let's talk about a variable displacement pump system. When you have a variable pump system, normally you have a relief valve downstream of it. The relief valve never opens. It's normally set 250 
to 400 above the pump compensator. So it is just there as a safety device in case the pump uh, fails, okay? Or if we have shock in the system, it will absorb some shock. So it is there for, for safety. So let's say that uh, I'm having an overheating problem. Now, overheating is a common failure of relief valves. Anytime you have a big pressure drop in a hydraulic system, you get heat, okay? Relief valves are notorious for creating heat because sometimes you can have such a large pressure drop across the relief valve, okay? So let's say I'm having an overheating problem, temperatures are reaching 150 degrees in a reservoir, um, and I check the gauge, okay? My pump, for example, is set at 2,000 PSI, and my relief valve, for example, is set at 2,250, okay? So if the system's overheating and I go look at the gauge, my gauge is reading 2,250, that's telling me that I'm dumping across the relief because if I get out my schematic, since I know how to read a schematic really well for troubleshooting, on the schematic it shows you the pump compensators at 2,000, the relief valve is at 2,250. So the gauge should be reading 2,000 because your pumps determine your maximum pressure, not the relief. If I'm saying 2250, that's going to turn on a light bulb and tell me that I'm dumping across my relief, okay? So no wonder I'm running hot. So it can be one or two things causing this problem. Either the knob turner has turned the pump compensator up above the relief valve setting, which can happen, or the pump compensator has failed in a way to where the pump is no longer variable, it's delivering maximum flow all the time, okay? So that's one way where a gauge can come in handy for troubleshooting. Okay? Another one is accumulators. Um, you can uh, uh, use a gauge to check a, uh, an accumulator. There's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, one is if you have a volume accumulator in the system. Now I'm not talking about uh, mobile equipment. And you have to be careful. And this is where, too, knowing the component function comes in. So it's very helpful in troubleshooting. Sometimes in some systems, accumulators are used strictly for storing uh, energy. They're used for um, uh, emergency type energy. If you have a power failure condition, the accumulator will come in and it'll open the valve, allow the fluid flow to dump back to tank at low pressure. Or sometimes they're used for emergency braking systems, okay, when, you, when there's a power loss uh, or electrical loss in the system, okay? So um, when you have an accumulator used for volume purposes, uh, what you're going to see is that accumulator is going to fill and it's going to discharge. It's going to fill and it's going to discharge. It's going to cycle repeatedly because as the cylinders in the system are continuously cycling. So when that happens, it tends to um, uh, heat up the bottom half as well. But what you're going to see is um, when, a, when an accumulator is charged correctly, your pressure gauge in the system, your pressure should never drop more than two to 500 PSI. They should stay pretty tight to the compensator setting. If you see the pressure drop more than 500 PSI on the gauge, it can point to an accumulator problem, so you need to check the precharge. Now, another way to troubleshoot an accumulator's precharge with the gauge is you want to turn the hydraulic system off. You want to allow the accumulator pressure to bleed down slowly and observe the gauge. Whenever the pressure drops, and it's going to drop real slow, it gets to a certain point, it drops quickly. If that was a thousand PSI where it's dropped quickly, you just saw what your precharge was on the accumulator. And you didn't even need to use a charging rig to check it, okay? So there are, uh, you know, other ways as well. Here's one more I'll give you uh, how to use a gauge for troubleshooting. Um, you can put a gauge upstream and downstream of a heat exchanger. Heat exchangers are rated for a maximum of about 250 to 300 PSI, depending on the heat exchanger. If the heat exchanger starts to uh, uh, plug up from contamination, you'll see your upstream pressure increase. You'll know if your heat exchanger is getting dirty. You, you'll know if it's time to, to clean it. Now, a lot of accumulator, uh, I'm sorry, heat exchangers uh, have bypass check valves. Some do not. If they have bypass check valves, they're usually anywhere from 30 to 65 PSI. 
If you know if you have a 65 PSI check valve and your pressure upstream is reading 65, guess what? We're bypassing across the check valve, aren't we? We're not doing much cooling. So the gauge is very helpful in troubleshooting the system, but then again, it shouldn't be the only thing that we use. There's other ways to, to, to troubleshoot as well. So let's move on to the infrared. Okay, the checking for heat in the hydraulic system uh, since uh, components when they bypass they create a pressure drop. Uh, they create heat. This is a very good tool, useful tool to, to, to uh, uh, check for bypassing. You can check the pump suction line and cage drain line. Um, the cage drain line is generally going to be hotter than the suction line because the oil inside the pump's rotating group has went through a pressure drop. Okay, so the leakage out of the pump is normally going to be hotter than the, the suction flow. Okay, now uh, what you should do is though, what's normal heat? What's normal bypassing, right? Well, usually one to three percent of the pump's total volume is normal bypassing, but as far as the heat we're seeing, what's normal? So, what we have to do is that's where the reliability checks come in. You should check your pump suction temperatures and case drain temperatures on a regular basis. So that way you check it this time, you know, your case drain temperature is only 15 degrees higher than the suction uh, temperature. You check it the, uh, the next time you go out there and it's increased by 30 degrees, something's wrong. What you're seeing is increased leakage, okay? Um, would I change a pump just because I saw the case drain line temperature hotter than the suction line? Of course not. That's not going to be my only uh, troubleshooting or indication of we've got a problem with the pump. What I would do then is uh, I would make some other checks, which we have some other tools here we can use to, to, to help determine that we actually do have a prompt pump problem. Okay. Now here's another way we can use one of these guys, accumulators. Now, now remember, you got to know the system, you got to be familiar with it, you got to know the component function. If you have an accumulator that's used for volume and it's constantly filling and discharging, it'll heat up the lower half or two thirds of the shell, and that's normally where your precharge is going to be. The nitrogen's cooler than the oil on the top. You can get a good idea of where that precharge is. It needs to be somewhere about one half is where the heat's going to change. Now, again, if you've got an accumulator that's just storing energy and just maintaining pressure, it's going to be the same temperature. Okay, So it does depend on how it's being used. Again, it goes back to component function. Okay, Now, um, another one, here's another example of how, how to use an IR camera. Heat exchangers again. You can check the upstream temperature versus the downstream temperature, and you can get a good gauge of your heat transfer that you have across the heat exchanger. So again, excellent troubleshooting tool to have in your toolbox for, for hydraulics. Okay. Now we have another one here, a flow meter. A flow meter can be installed in a case strain line permanently if you want to. Now just keep in mind, if you have one installed permanently, however, uh, they, they do have to be kept clean. If they do start to get cloudy or varnished up because you had some overheating problems, they might not be at read as correctly. You do have to take them apart and clean them from time to time if you do see that happen. But it's a good tool to have. You don't have to leave it in there if you don't want. You can purchase one of these and keep it in your toolbox. Put it in there when you get ready to check your flow. Okay. Now as far as case drain flow goes, um, if you have a pump that is uh, say 10 gallons per minute, 10% if you see 10% of that total pump volume in a flow meter, then that's way too much. If you've reached 10%, that's too much flow, I would say go ahead and uh, replace that pump. Okay. Um, another place you can use a flow meter, in the outlet of a pump. Um, now again, this we're going to go back to knowing component function. Fixed displacement pumps, they deliver full volume all the time. They never back off. They deliver full flow. Okay. Now, of course, once you put a fixed displacement pump 
or, or create a resistance downstream, the higher the resistance is going to cause some bypassing to occur in the pump. So fixed displacement pumps, they bypass internally. So if you had one of these downstream of fixed displacement pump and it was operating under pressure and it was 10 GPM and you saw only six gallons per minute out of your uh, flow meter with it under pressure, then something's wrong with your pump. It's leaking, okay? Variable pumps, a 10 GPM variable pump could deliver 10 gallons per minute, it can deliver one, it can deliver three, it can deliver four, it all depends on what the system needs. So you have to know that, hey, that's a variable pump, you may see different, uh, the, the flow meter change here depending on how many actuators are actually moving at any given time, okay? But you can still monitor it, uh, put it downstream and check the, uh, uh, on the pump and see how the pump is operating, if it's putting out its uh, maximum flow. Um, some systems have relief valves where you can physically disconnect the, re the relief valve tank line and install this in the tank line of the relief. Uh, and you can even leave it there permanently if you want uh, for troubleshooting the system, okay? Now, another place I've seen these flow meters used a lot, a lot of paper mills or plants that have lube systems, they have flow meters downstream of their lube pumps because it, is, because it is very important that we know we have the proper amount of lube oil going into our bearings, going into our roll. So a flow meter comes in handy, we can check on the flow coming out of our pump to make sure that we have a proper fluid flow, okay? So this is another good item as well to have uh, in your toolbox for troubleshooting. Um, and there's one more. We have the amp meter, okay? Now, one thing about uh, uh, electric motors is um, that we need so much current draw to actually rotate a pump at a certain amount of volume and a certain pressure, okay? Because that electric motor has to develop enough current to overcome its resistance, just like in hydraulics. In hydraulics, resistance is relative to, or I'm sorry, pressure is relative to resistance, okay? So um, there is a formula out there that we use for electrical horsepower. It is GPM times PSI times .0067 will tell us how much horsepower is required to uh, operate a pump at a certain pressure. Well, also, what that means is that anytime your pressure drops in the system, it affects your current. Your current's going to drop. If you have pressure but your flow drops off, your current's going to drop. So any of those two factors will affect a current draw. So, in other words, if I check the suction line and case drain line, and my case drain line was 30 degrees hotter, okay, I put a flow meter in there, and it's reading more than 10%. Then I check the current draw, and the current draw is way low. Guess what I just found out? There is definitely something wrong with my pump. I feel safe in changing it and not changing it for no reason, okay? So a lot of times, we can't just go by one troubleshooting tool to determine if we have something wrong with the component. It's more like being Sherlock Holmes. You've got to go out there and do some investigating, and then you put all of your information together and say, you know what? It does look like I have a bad pump. All of these techniques I'm, telling, I'm mentioning to you right now, uh, we teach in our programs. Uh, we teach them in all of our basic programs, our, our machine-specific programs. All of these tools and techniques we're, we're learning today, we use them. We teach them to our students. We even use them in the field. These are all proven techniques, and they do work. Um, if you want to learn more about us, uh, you can go to www.gpmhydraulic.com and learn more about our two-part training process.